Okay, let us move along now and keep talking about this developing flyweight story. So uh, we heard from Henry Cejudo earlier on. As you may recall, it all kind of started with a tweet from Jose Shorty Torres on, I believe, Wednesday afternoon, where he went online, announced to the world that he had been released from the UFC. And that kind of started the snowball of, okay, what's really going on with the flyweights? And then we found out about Cejudo, TJ, and TJ going down to 125. So I thought it would be interesting to hear from Mr. Torres himself, who is joining us right now via the Magic of Skype from all the way in Bahrain. There he is. Jose, how are you? I'm great, man. How about yourself? I'm doing great. You are in Bahrain right now? Yes, I'm in the Kingdom of Bahrain right now for Brave International Fight Week. I'm commentating for the IMAF, the International Mixed Martial Arts Federation, the Amateur World Championships, and uh, I'm guest commentating from Brave as well this weekend. Wow, that's amazing. How, how's it going so far? So far, today's been day one. I commentated for about 20 or 22 matches today, and overall, I mean, the competition level is risen so much ever since i was a world champ in 2014 and 2015 it is extremely incredible and how how big of a deal is this over there in bahrain it's it's a huge thing i mean the first three years were in vegas for ufc fight pass at the ufc fight expo, uh, expo and we had about 170 to 200 athletes now we're at 370 athletes in 54 countries from around the world and i mean our main goal is to try to get into the olympics and i mean we're getting closer every single year so this is all amateur, correct? This is all amateur. And I, I always say this is pro-level guys, the amateur ranks, because you have to qualify just to be a national champ, compete just for that to eventually fight for Worlds. And, and how many days is it? It's a five-day tournament, or it's a six-day tournament. You fight five days, four days in a row, you take a rest day, and then the final day you 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 know you fight on Saturday. So Friday is the rest day. Wow. And uh, are the weight classes the same as the ones in the pro ranks? Yeah, so the weight class is the same. The difference is every single day you have to weigh in. So after the first day, you get a 1% allowance, then 2%, then 3%, uh, 4 and then 5 is the final day. And what are they wearing in the fight? So right now, I believe Green Hill is a sponsor, so they wear Green Hill shorts. If you're red corner, you're wearing all red. If you're in blue corner, you wear all blue, and they also wear a uh, rash guard matching the shorts. Okay, and no padding anywhere? So the padding, you wear... Pretty much, you know, sleeve shin guards, so there's no real much bone-to-bone -bone contact. And then you're wearing seven-ounce MMA gloves instead of the typical four. Again, you're fighting five times in a week. It, you're going to take some injuries. So being able to help prevent that in any circumstances is key. Okay. And you competed in this, right? Yeah, I competed it two years in a row. But for me, again, it's a developing organization still. So when I first competed in it, there was no shin guards. It was just still the four ounce MMA gloves. And then my second year, we developed the seven ounce MMA gloves. And then we had uh, like super small, you know, sleeves for the shin guards. Okay. Wow. Well, that's great that you're part. And by the way, 20 matches in a day. Are you exhausted now from, from speaking? No, no. It's, it's something I like to do. Commentating is, is something I feel I'm, I'm naturally good at. And I, it's something I really want to do more of, and this is just something I get to put on my resume. And again, I'm going to guest commentate for, uh, you know, Brave Fighting Championship this weekend as well. So it's it's a really really good experience. I actually think I'm commentating for uh, Titan FC's uh, event in Kazakhstan. Oh, that's right. Yes, I heard about that. I think that's uh, December 21st, off the top of my mm -hmm. head. Right? Yeah, their big debut in Kazakhstan. That's going to be on Fight Pass. I heard about that last week. Um, okay, so let's talk about your career here, your actual fighting career, not the broadcasting career. When did you get word that you were released from the UFC? So I got word the pretty much the day I posted my video. I woke up, you know, that morning uh, immediately from a, a call. My manager, Lex McMahon, saying, "Hey, man, um, they're gonna email you your release papers. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, but uh, you know, go eat some tacos, go enjoy yourself a little bit. You're probably not gonna fight for a little while." And, the crazy thing was, this all started when DJ got traded. Everyone's talking about DJ Ben Askren, and I go, "Hold on, wait." what about the small guys zone? And no one was looking at the bigger picture. And I had my own YouTube series called Inside Team Shorty where I made a speculation video on all rumors, allegations of since DJ's gone, we had the best thing in the UFC, you know, that the UFC had to offer the best champion ever in its history. And even then, you, um, Dana White wanted to, you know, he threatened to cut the division, but now he's gone. What else do we have to offer? That's our best thing we had to offer. We we don't have a Conor McGregor or you know the the smack talkers that are all hyped up. The only one people really knew were 
DJ. And the next guy they wanted to really bring up was Sergio Pettis. But no offense to Sergio, he kept losing to the best guy. And Sergio's like, all right, I'm going to 35. And it's something that I believe he knew in advance as well. And that's that's one of the things. So when I started boasting that, I called Mick or Lexic Man called Mick and we started asking the rumors. And he goes, no, no, we don't have any thoughts on it. And then a few days later, okay, yeah, we're having thoughts on it. And then a few days later, I received my release papers. Wow. Now, how did that feel when you got that? After you, you're two and one in the UFC, right? Um, pretty uh, one, one, one and one. Excuse one. me, one and one, one in one. the UFC. You had the crazy finish, and then you had the fight in uh, Los Angeles that didn't go your way. Obviously, back in August, uh, I'm, I'm assuming if I would have asked you back then, you probably didn't think that you would get released after that after one loss. When reality sunk in, what did it feel like? Well, I I know I wasn't, or at the time, I didn't know I was going to get released after one loss, but I did have some fear of you know the flyweight division eventually being cut because again I, I have a resume that's never been heard of in mma mainly for the professional realm and i've done things that people haven't been able to do so fast in my career and i was still picked last in a sense you know to be at, into the ufc i was kind of picked last minute nine day notice and then given a week and a half after my fight with jared brooks a 20 day notice against alex Perez. i lost 54 pounds in, in two months uh, and I'm a, I'm a flyweight that's more than quarter of my weight competed so be it i lost it happens in the sport and then i was hey you're possibly gonna fight in december you know what you're gonna fight sometime early next year oh you know what here are your release papers and it's it sucks because i was getting ready i was in denver i was training with you know trevor whitman dwayne ludwig and and just getting ready with team elevation just doing my thing and hoping possibly for a last minute, even 35 pound fight. When we talked to Mick, he goes, yes, we're probably gonna bump some guys up. I go, cool, well, I was a Titan FC Bantamweight champ. I've shown you know half of my professional career, my four wins or my eight wins, four of them being at, at the Bantamweight division, my two world championships as the amateur and majority of my amateur career was at 135. I've shown it, I can compete against some of the best. He says, ah, no, your last fight you lost, it's okay, we don't want you. Wow, so you were not given the option to move up? was not given the option whatsoever and it's it 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 sucks because it's one of those things that I've worked so hard to accomplish all the things I've been able to accomplish and I, I get no in a sense respect for it. Uh were you told or was your manager Lex told that they are shutting down the one twenty five pound division? Yeah, my manager was told and I was told by him. I've never spoken to Mick or Sean Shelby directly. Um when it comes to anything UFC related, that's just not my my forte. But um yeah, you know Lex McMahon was talking to them and he's just, you know, the messenger, you know, relaying the message to me. And it just, again, it's, it's frustration sets in because I've accomplished so much at both divisions. And that's something I wanted to do in the UFC is possibly be a double weight class champ. Not because Connor did it or DC has done it, it's because I've done it already in Titan FC. I really do believe I can do it again, but I wasn't given the opportunity no matter what. So if you were given the opportunity to go up to 135, you would have taken that, right? Uh, 100 percent and i would i would even i would much rather and i've told mick this i would much rather take a last minute fight at 35 but right. even in both my fights with jared brooks and alex perez because they were so last minute i go hey i would love to fight catchweight at 30 or even just bump it up 35 alex perez got the opportunity heck even uh mark de la rosa and uh joby sanchez that fight they're they're both flyweights but they got to move up to bantamweight i don't know if you know joby got cut from losing that fight but it's one of those things that I feel that's what's going to happen. That's how they're going to eventually start cutting these flyweights to go, hey, you're not just fighting for a fight. You're fighting for your contract and your career. So once DJ got traded and then we start to find out stories like yours about guys getting released, I think most people thought Henry Cejudo would then move up to 135 and fight TJ for the belt and then they would dissolve the division. But the story is that TJ is going down to fight for the flyweight title. What did you think when you heard that? I think it's just... WME, in a sense, trying to make their money back for buying the UFC. You think about when WME came in, they're doing nothing but money fights, trying to bring the fans and the crowds go crazy. And with this, this whole problematic thing of, oh, they're cutting the flyweight division, and now they say TJ Dillashaw is going down to fight for the flyweight championship. It makes no sense, but it gets the fans thinking. It makes the media guys go crazy. And out of nowhere, everyone wants to watch this spectacle. It's a win-win for both. If TJ wins the belt, he becomes a double weight class champ, and he's respected that much more. Any fight he gets next is going to be huge. But if Cejudo wins... There's an automatic rematch at 135, and the fans are definitely going to watch that as well. Ah, okay. It's a bit confusing, though, no? It definitely is confusing, but that's the thing is confusion, all these things, it, it really gets the fans wanting more. But you look at when, you know, and I could be horribly wrong at this speculating, but you look at when WME came in, 
how many money fights have there been? Like big, big money fights that honestly make no sense. Mm. Brock Lesnar is getting a, a, an immediate title shot after being in PED, you know, uh, off of PEDs, but he gets a title shot. Derek Lewis didn't even want a title shot, but he says his balls get high. He had 600,000 followers, and they know they can make money off this. So here, we're going to push you as, as fast as possible to get this title shot, even though, for example, Curtis Blades is number one and you know definitely deserves it. You look at Jasir Formiga. No one honestly knows him in the, in the United States, but he's deserved the title shot, and he deserves a rematch against Henry Cejudo, but they're not giving him the opportunity, even though he worked so hard to get to it. So it's one of those CM Punk. Sam Punk has never even fought in his life before, but his pro debut is at the pinnacle of the sport, and that's the UFC. And it's it's one of those things that's it's belittling to all of those guys, all those MMA athletes that work so hard to achieve that level, and then we get you know cut because we're small guys. Does it sour you on the sport? All of this? Um, it doesn't sour me on the sport. It sours me on the UFC because okay. it's one of those things that I believe they're coming to UFC because whoa. Well, it's not beneficial for them. Why spend all this money on all the athletes, the 35 plus athletes in the flyweight division when they're always going to be on UFC Fight Pass? I mean, how many main events has DJ ever been out of his 11 title fights, or excuse me, I think 12 total title fights, 11 title defenses? I think he was a main event twice, three times. The only other main event besides DJ was Sergio Pettis and Brandon Moreno, and that was in Mexico City, two Mexican fighters. That makes nothing but sense. But after that, when's the last time you've seen a flyweight main event? Never. When's the last time you seen, I mean, uh, freaking Joseph Benavides and Sergio Pettis, they were fighting number two and three ranked guys, going to hopefully get whoever won would have got a, a title shot, but they're on UFC Fight Pass in Chicago. That makes no sense. <laughs> I, I, I do think DJ was more than two or three times, but I do get what you're, what, what you're saying. Um, why do you think the flyweights never created that buzz? Why do you feel like people are... I don't know, so lukewarm towards them. I don't I don't believe it's people. Oh. It's anyone I've talked to, whether they've been at big MMA fans or not, they love flyways. We're very technical, we're very fast, we're very explosive. We might not have the one shot knockout power, at least not most of us, but we put on some great shows. I mean, even the the fights in Denver, I think there were two flyweight fights technically, and they were both split decision. They went the distance and they went back and forth. They were amazing fights. It's the fact that the UFC doesn't promote them, so the average fan doesn't get to see them. It's one of those things that if the UFC says, Hey, this guy is awesome, you should watch it, more than likely the average fan is gonna do so. Yeah. It's a weird thing when I hear people say Oh, those guys are, are so small. I feel like I could beat them up. No, you can't beat them up. There's no chance that you could beat them up. Like, it's like, what, well, just because they, they, I, I, I mean, I like just be, you'd rather watch two big men brawl this like completely untechnical, if that's even a word fight, as opposed to two guys who are incredible athletes flying all, all over the place. Um, amazing technique. I mean, it makes no sense to me. I, I still can't understand why people say that it doesn't matter how big they are or how small they are. If you're a good athlete, you're a good athlete. But yet, for some reason, fans keep saying that, or I think the UFC, um, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy now, and they don't want to get behind it. And quite frankly, as I said to Henry, this is the wrong time to get rid of the division because you have new blood at the top, new champion who's promotable. He's an Olympic gold medalist. He speaks multiple languages. He's got a great backstory. Like, if there was ever a time not to kill the division, this is that time. It makes no sense, and I can understand your frustration. And it gives so much room for opportunity, like you're saying. Again, you have a new champion. You have all these athletes that are dying to get up there, but they're not giving us an opportunity to do so. And I think the the next cash cow was supposed to be Sergio Pettis. It just he kept losing to the best guy, and so be it. But they never gave anyone else an opportunity to come up and get that chance. So what do you do now? Where do you go from here? For me, I'm already you know talking to a few promotions. It's something that. You know, just in case, I always had on the back burner of like, hey, I've, I've talked to these promotions before I signed with the UFC, but, you know, I'm talking to one, Ryzen, Brave, I'm, you know, obviously here with uh, the Kingdom of Bahrain, uh, KSW, and possibly even Bellator here in Europe. So it's one of those things that I'm in, being introduced to so many people, and I've already been in talks to them the day I was released by the UFC. Wow. So you feel like there are options, good options out there for you? Yeah, and, and uh, amazing options. I can tell you this. It's easily just so many more options than what the UFC gave me. Again, my my goal is not just to be a fighter, but any contract I sign, whether it be with Brave or whatever promotion, is I'm going to try my best to commentate. I'm going to try my best to be there almost every event, working backstage, doing something that doesn't just make me a fighter. I could be on UFC Fight Pass, I can, or excuse me, Fox Sports 1, and be a commentator, be an analyst, 
be that type of guy. I'm not just a fighter, and that's something I want to prove to people. I just need the promotion to be able to give me that leeway to do so. Uh, one announced that they're doing a flyweight Grand Prix. Does that interest you? Oh, that's amazing. I mean, you look at 1FC, they have, they're right now going to be the most dominant promotion with the best flyweight division. You have the best flyweight in history, Demetrius Johnson. You have uh, Karat, who's a former 1FC champion. Adrian Amaras, who's another former 1FC champion. I believe there's a few more. And then you have nothing but title contenders. So these eight man bracket, this eight man bracket's amazing. But with the UFC be, you know, releasing all these guys, mainly. I think the UFC, this is my opinion, I believe the UFC is going to finish the flyweight division at the, the title fight uh, with TJ and Cejudo. I think they should open it up to a 16-man bracket and make it the biggest flyweight event in the world. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be fun. Um, And, and your next fight, would it be at 125 or 135? You know, it's something that I've always speculated. I've always wanted to do both, and that's my that's going to be my next contract. Whatever promotion I sign with, I want to do both. I want to prove that what I did in Titan FC wasn't a fluke, and I definitely can do it again. I want to fight for both 125 and 135. All right. Uh, I wish you the best, Jose. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for, for letting us know what happened last week. And by the way, can people here in America watch your work over there in Bahrain? Yeah, well, I really appreciate it. Actually, if people want to watch my uh, my work at the Brave International Fight Week for the IMF Federation, it's IMF, I-M-M-A-F-E-D dot TV to watch pretty much all the fights coming up. And there's four cages. Again, 300 and I think 70, 375 athletes fighting from all around the world, 54 countries. And I'm commentating in cage four from what I know. But enjoying myself, having fun. I appreciate all of the support. And that's why I say we can. We will together. We are Team Shorty. Thank you so much, guys. All right, man. All the best to you, uh, Shorty Torres. We're looking forward to what's next for you. Thank you. All right. There he is, Shorty Torres stopping by from Bahrain. I think that is the first time. So we've had someone from Israel on today's show, not just someone, Hoist Gracie. And now a guest, Jose Shorty Torres, no longer in the UFC from Bahrain. It's amazing how quickly things change. Remember, he made his debut on that card in Utica with the crazy Jared Brooks finish where he got flipped over. It was kind of like the Canadian destroyer and, and knocked himself out with the slam. Uh, and now here we are five weeks or five months later, I should say, and no longer in the UFC after going one and one, lost to Alex Perez in Los Angeles. And we've heard from other uh, flyweight fighters via social media as well, who said over the past week that they too were recently released by the UFC. So the UFC hasn't come out. Uh, I, I believe Dana White was asked in Denver after the, the fight night card um, what they're gonna do with the division. Uh, he hasn't come out and said, that's it, we're done come January 27th. Uh, but it seems as though people have been told that the end is near.